to the business of today. The second, the first talk to resume in this room after our tea break is Toolsmithing, Convenience Through Code, presented by Jeremy Thurgood. Jeremy, I could probably do this from memory, I've known Jeremy for a very long time, but I'll, I'll read what he wrote instead. Jeremy's been writing Python code since before function decorators were a thing, and still thinks it's a pretty cool language. When he's not hacking on a side project or reading a good book, he can often be found tinkering with the innards of some container orchestration system or other in his endless quest for the perfect cluster infrastructure. I hope the capitals came through in my pronunciation there. He is passionate about continuous learning and tries to make at least one exciting new mistake every day. Um, I think that pretty much tells you everything you need to know about the style of this talk because that is Jeremy to a T. Jeremy? And the Thank thing you. I have just learnt one moment ago is that um, if I make this full screen, I can't see my speaker notes over here because Mac. Yeah. It's just an, I hate having a significant chunk of my screen taken up by title bars and address bars and URLs, and eventually I'm left with like 12 pixels at the bottom for the thing I'm actually working on. So having it here is annoying. Toolsmithing, convenience through code. I've been very pleased this year to see a lot of the talks are about tools that people have built to solve particular problems that they have. And I think there's not nearly enough of that happening in this industry or in the world in general. So uh, apparently I need to reload this because my slides think they're in the middle somewhere. Um, there, that's better. Every good talk should begin with a definition. So what is a toolsmith? Uh, the obvious is a person who makes tools. But in the context of this talk, I'm talking about somebody who will build tools to solve the problems they have, to make themselves more productive, to make their friends and colleagues and random strangers on the internet more productive. And now that we're building tools, why should we be building them? So the first and most obvious is to save time. If you've got something that takes uh, three hours to do and you can automate it so that it takes an hour and a half, you've saved a whole bunch of time. That's value. Time is money, I'm told by the business people. Try to plug that into my physics equations, doesn't quite work. The next reason is to reduce complexity. My brain can handle a very, very low level of complexity, and as soon as there's more complexity than it can handle, I just can't function. So we all typed import this into a Python shell at some point. Simple is better than complex. Tools can help with that. The next reason is there are a bunch of tools we use all the time. Sometimes the tools that are available don't quite fit. We've got a nail and a box of screwdrivers or we've got a box of screwdrivers, but none of them are the right shape for these three screws that I need to adjust. And finally, building tools is fun. It's certainly a lot more fun than doing the same manual thing over and over again. One of the reasons we got into this industry, presumably, is because we enjoy writing code, and people who enjoy writing code tend not to enjoy typing the same thing over and over again with five minutes in between, because that's boring. So let's go through each of these in more detail. Um, XKCD did the whole time-saving thing far better than I ever could. So look at this chart, uh, figure out at the using the two axes how much time it'll take you to build the tool, how much time you'll save, uh, how much is worthwhile. Um, sorted. Except it's always more complicated than that because tools are these kinds of tools are made out of code. Code requires maintenance, and that's always a problem. So you can often get really big wins, but if you're not looking at like a, a hours per week win, saving time may not be the main reason you build a tool. So the next reason, complexity. Simple is better than complex, I've said before. Tools can help you get rid of boilerplate. Um, my examples will all be Kubernetes YAML because that's been my day job for a while. To deploy something with Kubernetes, you need about six and a half kilometers of YAML. And most of that, you don't need to care about. It's the same for 
it, all the applications of this type. And if it's there, you need to worry about it. You need to sort through it to find the stuff that you actually do care about. Getting rid of the boilerplate makes things simpler and also faster. And that's because you focus on the things you care about. If I'm deploying an application, I care about what container image am I using? How much memory does it need? What are the environment variables in the configuration? I don't care about how are the logs getting to the logging system, because that's the ops team's job. Well, technically my job, because I'm on the ops team. But if you're deploying something in our infrastructure, you shouldn't care about that. And I don't want you to touch that and send the logs somewhere else, because then I have to find them when you need to debug something. Which brings us to the next point, which is remove sources of error. If you can't see or touch the log uh, configuration, then you can't break it. And then the logs will be there when you need it. Assuming your application actually logs something useful, which is out of scope for this particular tool. Next point, um, existing tools. So the world is full of tools. Um, usually you can find the one you to meet your needs. If you want to write some code, there are dozens of different editors you could use. Um, Emacs is the one I choose. Probably not a good fit for everybody else. In the other room, we've just heard James explain in great detail why VX code is something you may or may not want to choose. Sometimes, if there isn't a tool that directly fits, you can make it fit. Emacs is not a fantastic editor. Emacs is an environment in which you build the editor that works for you. So I took a tool that didn't quite fit. I wrote a bunch of Lisp code, which I now have no idea what it does, but it, it works. And now the tool that doesn't quite fit works better for me. And if all else fails, you can build your own. We have a deployment process problem. None of the existing tools even come close to doing what we want, so we had to build one. And finally, building tools is fun. Happy people are productive people. So hands raised, who here feels productive when they're grumpy and depressed and have had to read through a kilometer of YAML? Exactly as many hands as I expected. Who here is productive when there's a cool new project that you care deeply about and the first few steps you can see exactly how to do them? Who's productive in that situation? Pretty much everyone, except that guy over there. Uh, please try and find some fun in your work, sir. <laughs> Just for the people who can't see the audience, there was nobody over there. I had to make someone up to, to make the joke. So we enjoy creative work, not tedious repetition. Writing software is creative work. And we don't write the same piece of code every day. That's boring. We want to do something new, something interesting. Solve a problem that's difficult enough to be interesting, but not so difficult that we can't actually solve it at all. And toolsmithing is creative work that replaces the tedious, repetitive stuff that we don't want to do. So it's a really good way to find the fun in what has become a boring job quite often. So that's the intro stuff. The main body of this talk is I'm going to walk through four different tools that I've built in the past couple of years, all of them very different. So in the talk description, I promised a tiny shell script. That is bigterm.sh. I also promised a moderately complex cluster configuration manager, which is custom tool. That's the only one that's bigger than a single file. Um, Filterplan2.py, the file name of that should tell you pretty much everything you need to know about it. And then clothsim.py is an art project which is kind of a work in progress. And not at all an excuse to show some of my artwork at a tech conference. <laughs> so bigterm.sh, what does it do? Well, it's right there in the name. Why do I need a tool for this? Well, 80 by 25 characters isn't always enough. But it's a pretty good default, because most of the time I hit my command control T, a terminal appears, I type a couple of commands, control D, the terminal goes away. That's all I need it for. 
But sometimes I want to write code. Those are generally terminals with a lot more stuff in them. Um, they stay around for days or weeks until I'm finished working on this particular thing. And manual resizing is inconsistent. I have to find where my mouse has disappeared to since I last used it. I've got to find where the mouse pointer is on the screen, click on the right part of the window, drag it until, is this big enough? Is it not big enough? Do I have an odd number of um, columns so that my uh, buffer separator down the middle of my screen is in the middle and I don't have different sized windows on either side? And that makes it annoying. And if I'm annoyed, I'm less productive, and I'm focusing on the problem of resizing the terminal instead of the problem that I'm actually trying to solve, where the terminal is the vehicle with which I solve it. So this is a tiny little problem, tiny little tool. So here's the implementation in its entirety. Um, I didn't bother putting a license on it. I'm pretty sure it's not actually licensable. If it is, well, public domain, if you want terminals exactly, 195 by 50 characters uh, at that particular place on the screen, feel free to type that into your editor. Of more interest is the, um, the comment at the top that tells future me where to find the documentation for those cryptic numbers. This took me about 20 minutes to write. After like four years of thinking, I really should find a way to write a tool to do this. 20 minutes, 19 of those were finding and reading the documentation. Uh, probably about 16 minutes was finding the documentation, then finding the cryptic numbers within it, and now it works. I didn't bother making it configurable because I only want one big terminal size on a regular basis. It's the right size for writing code for me. <clears throat> it's a good size for anything else that needs to be big. And if I need something different, well, that's when I find my mouse and make it exactly the size I need for this particular task, which I'll probably never be doing again. And the results of this tool building process. Uh, how did it work out for me? First thing, I only ever notice it when I'm on a computer that doesn't have it. And I type big tab, and nothing happens. And then I have to try and figure out how to resize the terminal manually. It has saved me exactly 6.3 bazillion context switches, I've counted. And for me, with moderate, well, it's moderate when I'm medicated, ADHD, it happens often enough that I open a terminal to do something, I resize the terminal, the terminal's now the right size. Why have I just opened a terminal? What was I trying to do? And then I have to go back to Slack to find the conversation I was having. And that costs me a bunch of time because context switches are expensive. And for some people, they're a lot more expensive than for others. And it paid for itself in happiness the first time I used it. I typed big, hit tab, hit enter. And my terminal was the right size in the right place. And it was glorious. Now it's just the way I expect things to, to be. And because I'm here talking about these tools in the context of toolsmithing, what lessons can we as a community, mostly you as the audience, learn from this particular tool? Firstly, well, only, a tiny tool that solves a tiny problem can be a big win. It was a 20-minute investment of time. It saves me probably under two seconds every time I use it, but it's avoids context switches, which can be costly. I don't have to worry about it. Stuff just happens the way I want. It's incredibly convenient, and it's a big win for me. Maybe something like that would be a big win for you. Maybe there's some tiny thing that I don't care about at all that matters really deeply to you. Build a tiny little tool. It's quick, it's cheap. Maybe it's a big win. If it isn't a big win, well, you've lost 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever. And now for something completely different, custom tool. It's a cluster configuration manager, which probably doesn't mean very much. And from the name and the description, you'll have no idea what it does and how it works, because it's very specific to our processes and how we work and how we like things to be. So the problem, why do we need a tool? 
Have you seen Kubernetes YAML? I have. I don't want to see any of it again if I can avoid it, but it's part of my job. There's a lot of stuff. It's kind of OK for what it does, but you've got deep nesting. And it's when you're like three pages into a single manifest describing some segment of a container deployment, it's, you'd have no idea how deeply you're nested. You don't know if you're dealing with one level or the level above or whatever. It's a massive pain. Secondly, deploying other people's stuff is boring. I don't want to do that. You wrote some code. You care about it. My job is making sure that it runs. I don't even necessarily know what the code does. I do know that it passes uh, CI and that it's been code reviewed by somebody who knows what they're doing, because that's the kind of organization we are. But I don't know that this is to solve an urgent problem that will give an extra 500,000 people access to healthcare that they didn't have before. That's the dev team's concerns. Um, I'm just doing the mechanical job of deploying it, which is boring. I don't want to do it. And from the other side, people coming to me to deploy their code is slow. I'm busy with something. I'll be with you in an hour. Um, nobody wants to wait an hour for their stuff to be deployed. So a tool will help with that. And back to focusing what, on what's important. What's important to me is that our production systems are stable. Everything's running the way it should. Um, no errors in the logs, that kind of thing. What's important to the dev teams is that their code is doing what it's supposed to be, that they're able to ap update stuff, that the urgent change that needs to be made right now gets made right now. So separation of concerns, each person cares about what's important to them. Uh, and can focus on what's important. Because this is a bigger tool, let's do some software engineering and come up with a, some requirements. Most of these are like the ops team's requirements. So what does it need to do? Firstly, static deploy manifests in the repo. We are not a Silicon Valley startup. We host services that uh, impact the lives of millions of people who don't even know what computers are. Well, probably they do. They have cell phones. But people in rural areas with no access to this kind of technology, it must work. And if we type Helm install whatever and get the thing that somebody committed without running the tests two hours ago deployed directly into production, there are all sorts of problems with that. So what we have in the deployment repo is exactly what gets deployed. Nothing more, nothing less. Next is minimal boilerplate, because the big part of this problem that we're trying to solve here is all the boilerplate. If you're deploying an app, you need to specify exactly the things that matter to that app. Nothing more, nothing less. You don't need to care about the other stuff, but the deployment system does because it's important for the deployment. Um, use upstream sources where practical. So if you're deploying something that's packaged upstream, um, I don't know, some like Grafana to look at logs or something like that, um, they publish deployment stuff, either as a Helm chart or Kubernetes manifests or something like that. If we can use that, we want to use that. We don't want to repeat all that work. But we also want to be able to make our own changes to that, because their defaults often don't work for us. And finally, it must be reasonably fast. If you're waiting 15 minutes for the tool to run, well, you're not waiting an hour for me to do it by hand, but it's still annoying. And part of what we do is the tool's doing a lot of different pieces of work that we can all do in parallel, so we do them in parallel. And it takes a couple of seconds to run, and you're done. Um, and that's great. Next, how do we go about building it, the approach we took? So first, find existing tools. Um, three of the main ones we use. Customize is a tool in like the Kubernetes space. It, it does about half the job we want. It understands Kubernetes manifests and can manipulate them in various ways. So it, you can tell it, um, for these container images, set the version to this, no matter what is in the, the deployment manifest. And it'll do things like that. 
that does the heavy lifting of all the generating the stuff that we, we do. Uh, Helm is kind of a standard Kubernetes deployment tool. That's only there because a bunch of our upstream sources are Helm charts, and we use it to basically use Helm as a template and have it spit out the deployment YAML that we actually want to use. And then YTT stands for YAML Templating Tool, and that's because using a um, using text formatting commands to try and build structured data that is indentation sensitive, which is what Helm does, is a gigantic pain, and what you get out is almost impossible to debug. YTT does templating on structured data, uh, specifically YAML. If that's a job you need to do, YTT is fantastic. If you don't need templated YAML, YTT is useless to you. Um, that's the most recent addition to this tool. Next, we need something that will glue all of these tools together, because none of them know about the other's existence, and we want to use all of them in a particular order to make our stuff work. And finally, once we've got the glue between those things, we also need to build the missing pieces, because there are some pieces that, um, that there aren't existing tools to do, or the tools aren't suitable, or it's small enough that there's no point getting an external tool to do it. We can just write it ourselves. So now that we know kind of what we're doing in the vague approach, um, the design. So it's a CLI tool. It has two commands, two stages of operation. So the first is the sources command. That fetches upstream sources. So it'll fetch Kubernetes YAML. It'll fetch an archive containing that stuff. It'll uh, clone a Git repo. Um, it'll use a Helm chart. Uh, Customize will also do templates with sort of external sources. So those are a bunch of the, the different kinds of inputs we can have. Um, it fetches everything that's required to generate the output. So all the upstream sources, it will download them from the internet, unpack the archives, run the Helm command to turn it into YAML. And in the end, we've got a big pile of stuff that can be used as input to the next step. And you only need to run this when the sources have changed. So my team runs it quite often because we manage all the infrastructure stuff. Um, the dev teams almost never need to run it because everything they need is already there. They're just writing an app definition that uses existing stuff. So the people who don't need to deal with the upstream sources don't need to run this command, don't even need half the tools installed and separation of concerns. Sources is the slow part, um, because that's talking to the outside world. Uh, and regenerate is fast. That builds the actual deployment manifest that does templating, that takes your app definitions and turns them into the, the YAML that gets deployed. And basically what it does is call customize and YTT to build the output. So the fundamentals of how this thing works, and then we've got a bunch of code to glue that all together and to do the bits that the tools don't do. So implementation, uh, it's written in Python, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it here. We use Trio for concurrency because it has a really sensible concurrency model. Uh, I did a talk about it previously. Go, if you have any need for asynchronous code in Python, look at Trio. It may not be exactly what you're looking for, but it's definitely worth looking at. Um, MyPy and Ruff to find most of the bugs. The type stuff and the linting has probably caught like two thirds of the bugs I wrote in the first place before I even ran the tests. If you don't know Ruff, look it up. It's the best linter available. It's written in Rust because linting should be really fast. And honestly, running it on a decent sized code base, the slowest part of running rough is waiting for the terminal to scroll to the bottom of the thousand um, lint issues it picked up. And it's basically got implementations of pretty much anything that um, PyFlakes or any of the popular PyFlakes plugins can do. Um, and they're regularly adding them as stuff gets updated. Um, and then we have a customized plugin to call YTT, which is not a great way to do it, but the way customize works, we have to have the YTT step 
in the middle instead of before or after. And that causes a bunch of issues which make it a little bit annoying to use. But the alternative is to re-implement all of Customize Ourselves, which we're just not going to do. Uh, it took us, when I say us, mostly me, uh, about between two and four months to build, but I was also working on other stuff at the same time. This was like mid-2020 when we were frantically trying to build uh, WhatsApp services for public health stuff for the obvious reasons given that time period. And since then, it's just worked so long that I've forgotten all the other implementation stuff. There, were, there was a lot more complexity to that, but that was two years ago. I can't even remember two weeks ago. Um, and obviously, it didn't make that much of an impression. So how did it work out for us? Well, deploys take minutes instead of hours or days. Some of them, if we're deploying a new application and it's different from the ones that we've deployed before, it can take a couple of days to figure out what we actually need to deploy. But then getting it into the repo and stuff is um, minutes, maybe a couple of hours for complex stuff. Uh, the dev teams do 90% of the deploys themselves. That I haven't measured that, but I see far more pull requests to the, to the deployment repos from outside my team than from inside my team. We have had no YAML-related injuries since 2021. This is a big deal. YAML has lots of sharp edges, and I still have all my fingers. But the external tools make setup somewhat annoying because you need to have all those tools installed somewhere. You need exactly the right version of Customize for reasons that are really annoying and too tedious to go into. And then because we're running some of our code as a Customize plugin, you need to have the virtual end with a tool installed active. You can't just use like Pipenv or something like that where you run the code with the right Python interpreter, but your environment is different. Uh, we've had to debug that a couple of times. So the lessons from custom tool, the big one. Um, sometimes the tool is it's basically a production system, and you treat it like one. We do proper design, code reviews. It lives in a repo, continuous integration. There's no deployment because it's a CLI tool and you pip install and then the git repo um, and you have it locally and then you have to do all the manual downloading the right tools and the right versions and putting them in your path and stuff. Um, and the target audience matters, uh, especially if it's more than just you. So in this case, the target audience is the ops team and the dev teams. Nobody else in the organization needs to care about the tool. Um, Everybody who uses it is comfortable with running command line tools, but some of the people don't actually know or care about all the details of the deployment stuff. So the dev teams don't need to understand how to manage like the source definitions and finding where we're downloading stuff from. That's my team's responsibility. Um, that's the more complex part of the tool. So the regenerate step is what they need to care about, and that's much easier much simpler. So that's a big tool. Now on to filter plan two, which is a Terraform plan filter. And if that is meaningful to you and sounds useful, my deepest sympathies. Why do we need a tool for this? So recently, AWS told us that the version of Kubernetes we're running is no longer going to be supported as of probably two or three hours ago, as I stand up here and talk. We have eight production clusters, or maybe 10, or perhaps nine. I've lost count. Um, the tools remember that for me, so I don't have to. Bunch of clusters to upgrade. Each of them takes between four and six hours to run the upgrade. And as part of the Kubernetes upgrades, we needed to update the Terraform module we used to manage that stuff. And in between then and now, there's been a big refactoring with lots of changes. And the upgrade notes, notes for the original thing say, they strongly recommend that you replace your cluster instead of trying to upgrade an existing one. 
let me think, we have a bunch of these things that run critical public health services. No, we're not going to throw it all away and start fresh. Um, they walk that back a bit and there's stuff in between that makes it slightly easier. But as a result, to do the upgrade, we have a thousand plus lines of Terraform plan output. I'll show you a brief snippet of that later. And a hundred plus affected resources. A resource could be a tag on a security group rule somewhere in AWS, or it could be your entire Kubernetes cluster. We need to make sure that every single one of these affected resources is being affected in the way we expect it to, and that it's not going to break everything. And at least one of those resources must be fixed manually before we run this tool, otherwise everything breaks. Terraform's not a fantastic tool. It's a lot better than it used to be. It's the best we found in the space, but there's some things it can't do. And this particular change, we need to do a manual step, otherwise the cluster becomes unusable during the upgrade and we then have to spend a bunch of time fixing it while everything's down and people are shouting at us, which is not fun. So we need to make sure that these 100 plus resources in this gigantic like multi-thousand line output is what we expect. So here's some sample output. The text is small, you don't really need to know very much. The top block is the smallest change I could find. The bottom one, which is highlighted, that's the one we care about. So let's design the tool. Meh, who has time for that? It's just a bunch of substring matches, right? How hard could it be? Well, it basically is just a bunch of substring matches. The top line, which tells us which resource changed and whether it's being created, deleted, updated, um, is fairly consistent. We can do substring matches on that. So we match all of those, and then it groups the things it finds into three sections. The first one is the stuff we expect. The tool has a bunch of hard-coded resource names. These are what we expect. Well, it's regular expressions. Some of them match more than one resource. Um, we only display that for completeness. Those are the things that we can ignore because the tool has told us that they're okay. It's things we, we know will change and they're changing in the, the expected ways. The unexpected block is things that we need to check manually. That's the stuff that only exists in like our data science repo which runs a bunch of different stuff. Or the one of the Department of Health repo clusters which has a different kind of database setup um, and more Redis deployments or something. And then the final block is the warnings. If there are any warnings, you need to fix those before you're allowed to apply this Terraform plan. Now the tool doesn't enforce that, but we do this on a call because nobody touches production systems alone, especially if they're doing major changes. So everyone looks at the output and nobody, well everybody says we fix this before we, uh, we move on. And it's 200 lines of very hacky code, most of which is the list of substrings that we're matching. Um, no tests, no repo, it gets the job done. So how did it work up, out for us? No clusters were harmed, at least not related to this. There were various other things related to stuff that had been done manually outside of our Terraform automation and that nobody had written down. Um, but nothing disastrous. We had maybe uh, 15 minutes of downtime on one of the clusters until we kind of went back to what we had before until we could find and fix the problem. Um, I spent a couple of hours trying to build a better version of this, but configuration became like twice as big as the original tool and it's not worth the effort. If we need this again, we'll build it again. What can we learn? So a tool that you use once or eight to 10 times and then throw away can still be incredibly valuable. Your tools don't need to be long-lived. Long and a hacky prototype that gets the job done might be what you need. You don't have to build a fancy tool to do something if you're going to use it once and throw, throw away. And finally, the art project, which I'll go through fairly quickly because Kim is waving at me over there telling me I'm running out of time. Um, it's an art project. I recently discovered that I can 
use Blender to make interesting 3D artwork. And um, I make a comic. I have so far three panels of it done. Um, but I need lots of renders for it. Each panel needs cloth simulation, and the cloth simulation has a bunch of steps which are manual and annoying and tedious and slow. And it takes me about an hour to do this manually for each panel. Um, so the, uh, the purpose of the tool is to automate that. As an example, and because I can show off my art, here is what one of the panels looks like with a fairly simple pose, which still needs some tweaks without the cloth simulation and with the cloth simulation. You can see the difference. I still need to do some work tweaking the parameters. And because I did some of this work while I was already here, I was doing it on my laptop where each simulation took like 20 minutes to run. So I'm not going to iterate on that a bunch of times. Um, but yeah, that, that's the reason. The implementation is it's the automate, I mean, the manual process, but automated. Um, Blender's APIs are made of global mutable state, which is not much fun to work with. But 3D modeling is made of global mutable state. You're manipulating uh, vertices and edges and faces and all of those kinds of things. Um, and you're working on the data structure that's over there because it's a lot of data. Um, still don't like it, but I can get by. It's very incomplete. It does most of the job, but like as soon as there's someone sitting on something, I now need to do, man do manual stuff because it won't handle interaction with objects that are not the characters or their clothing. Um, how did it work out for me? Don't really know yet. Um, SCOM has limited my art time somewhat significantly. Art computers with fancy GPUs in them need electricity to run. Um, early results are promising. You've seen that it took 25 minutes to run, during which time I could do 25 minutes of other stuff. I wasn't pointing and clicking in Blender. So what can we learn from this one? Um, some tools change as requirements change. Every project I do, this cloth simulation stuff, has different requirements. I hard code the names of the various meshes and armatures for copying poses and stuff because it's easier than making it configurable. At some point, I probably might. And if you try hard enough, you can find a way to show off your artwork at a tech conference. Um, so conclusion, um, we've seen four different tools. We've learned at least one kind of important lesson from each of them. Uh, and where do we go from now? So you want to start building tools. Don't be afraid to try. You'll almost certainly learn something, even if the tool ends up not being useful. And about half the tools I've built um, never went anywhere, but taught me a lot more about the problem I was trying to solve. Don't be afraid to fail for the same reasons. Um, Sometimes it's just not worth the effort. With the filter plan two, I thought, let me make this a better tool. No. I, I could rebuild it a dozen times before making it a better tool would put, uh, give us any benefit. And I've needed something like this once in the past three years. Um, there's more than one way to do it. There are a bunch of ways to build tools, a bunch of different problems. So pick one that fits the problem you're solving. If you need big term dot SH, build that. If you need a cluster configuration manager, treat it as a software engineering project. If you're doing artwork, hack around in Blender's API. And that's all I have for now. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I must confess very much after my own heart, my hard drive must have hundreds of little .py files. No one is ever going to see, but they save me some effort, which is exactly the kind of thing you're talking about. But you're much better at it than I am, in fairness. Do we have any questions? Anybody got anything to ask? Uh, yes? No? Hands? No one? We all stand into silence by thinking what tools we should be writing instead. Um, let me just check online. 
Okay, nobody has any comments there either. Also stunned into silence about thinking, well, what should I be automating instead of sitting here? Um, in all honesty, there, there really is super value in just writing tools for yourself. You don't have to always make them useful for someone else, exactly as Jeremy points out. Quick and nasty is sometimes fine. Although I think, Jeremy, you'd agree there's a fine line between when quick and nasty becomes not good enough. But Although he's not paying attention to me anymore. I am paying attention, but I've just uh, seen James's question. Did I write a tool to count how many context switches I saved? <laughs> no, I did not. Oh. Because the context to do that in a way that in any way meaningful or accurate would require basically recording every UI interaction on my system. And this is a laptop in 2023, which means that the hard drive is perpetually full no matter how often I delete all the stuff I don't actually need right now. So there, I think there are tools that will measure stuff like that, but there's no real value. Um, I can say 6.3 bazillion exactly for the laughs, and that's what's important. <laughs> that wasn't real. <laughs> cool. It is exactly as real as your definition of bazillion. Awesome, thank you. I think, yeah, I actually missed that online one. Thanks for catching it. I was looking in the main room uh, channel, not the, the thread. Are there any further questions for Jeremy? Otherwise, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeremy.